Check Podcasts. Hi, I'm Bruce Williams. I'm the CEO of the Greater Victoria Chamber of Commerce. Welcome to Chamber Chats, coming to you as always from the podcasting studios here at the Czech Media Group, one of our chamber champions. I am speaking to you from the ancestral lands of the Lekwungen speaking nations, known to us as the Songhees and Esquimalt nations. It's our privilege and honor to live and work alongside them every day. Chamber Chats is made possible by the support of Island Savings, a division of First West Credit Union, who have a team of experts with solutions as unique as your business. And we're going to meet one of those experts in just a minute. So we're kind of in that year end, new beginning of a year period right now. And it's been an interesting 12 to 14 months. The interest rates have gone up. Of course, before our very eyes, they just rose. Um, That's caused inflation, which has been surrounding us all as well. We've still got challenges with workers, uh, with daycare, with housing, all of those things. So this is kind of a time where we're going to take a look back for perspective and take a look forward for planning when it comes to your uh, business and personal finances. A couple of experts to join us. First of all, um, a a chamber champion in his own right. Chris Work is the chair of the Board of Governors at the Greater Victoria Chamber of Commerce, and Chris is a partner at Dosange & Work. He is a chartered professional accountant. Chris, how are you? I'm doing great this morning. Thanks for having me, Bruce. Thank you for being here. And Graham Kay is with us as well. Graham is a business banking advisor with Island Savings. Graham, how are you? Doing well, thank you. Good. Chris, I want to go back and start with you. So you work with with both uh, business and people with their personal finances, correct? Yes, 100%. So we're a a CPA firm. So we were fortunate to work with many local businesses and small businesses uh, operated here in Victoria. And as a byproduct of that, we do a number of personal income tax returns as well. Okay. So let's take a look back to the past year. Again, turmoil, things moving around, opportunity and challenges all at the same time. What kind of a year has it been? What are you hearing from your clients? It's been a challenging year. I think um, 2023 has proven uh, a couple of headwinds that have uh, struck small businesses. Uh, The first and on everyone's mind is higher interest rates. So how have rates affected their businesses, how it's limited their chances for expansion, uh, and and, or if they've had previously financed assets, um, higher costs of servicing those debts have really hurt the bottom line. So, Graham, I'm going to come to you now uh, at Island Savings. You're you're helping people deal with their finances, both personal and business, but some of that money is yours. I mean, it, it's from the credit union if you're managing a portfolio of someone who has borrowed to operate their business. Tell me what kind of things you've been hearing over the last year. Yeah, so I think uh, just to piggyback off of interest rates, I think we're a big topic for everyone. Um, that was what we saw happening everywhere. Um, another one that has come up was the CBA repayment, so the Canadian Emergency uh, Business Account. That has come up uh, pretty much, they extended it to January 18th. So um, having those conversations, it's been pretty much half the year of having those conversations with our business members. Also, I think um, some other uh, small members are dealing with some regulations around short-term rentals. So that has also come up. So I think those three topics have been the most predominant that we've seen throughout the year. Yeah, I want to go back to SEBA. Chris, uh, you and I and all of us at the Chamber have been talking about this SEBA thing. We're, by the way, recording this in the middle of December. So there may have been a change on that repayment schedule for SEBA. But Chris, how much has that popped up in your conversations with your clients? Oh, often. I know the, the banks really uh, and, and credit unions take the take the lead on that. Um, but I, I think every financial advisor is um, re- reminding their clients not to miss the repayment date. And also their changes to the rules were, ended up being very confusing, um, but not really that substantive. Um, so they extended it from December 31st to, to January 18th, which really just added confusion of did it really get delayed or is it just a, a two, three week delay yeah. or extension? Uh, Graham, I don't want to put you on the spot and I don't want any personal information, but can you give me an example of a conversation that you've had with one of your clients that's pretty typical of what you're hearing, whether it's SIBA or dealing with interest rates or inflation or whatever it might be? Yeah, so I think um, conversation with the SIBA repayment, uh, a lot of we've had those conversations if they're unable to have the cash flow on them now is looking at financing um, to get that forgiveness if they did qualify. So seeing a lot of those conversations uh, come to fruition, we started reaching out, I think, late October to start having those conversations with our members, just because we want to get on top of the ball with them and look at financing opportunities if they're unable to pay with their own cash flow. Um, I have had a few businesses as well that did not want to look at financing and they do want to continue with the SIBA repayment plan, um, which is just supporting those interest only payments. So we've had a few of those as well, um, just because they plan that their future, um, they're going to have a lot more cash flow in those next two years. But those have been primarily the topics that we've uh, been going through. Yeah. Uh, Chris, I want to go back to 2022. That was the year when the economy kind of surged after the pandemic and the economy grew faster than we had anticipated. Uh, but interest rates were lower then. So tell me about the circumstance. If we had this conversation a year ago, what would we have been talking about? I think there'd be a, a lot more optimism, a, a lot more um, 
joy, I think, for, for business owners all around, um, on a whole. Um, and I think the reason was is 20, uh, 2022 was, as you mentioned, a year of recovery. Uh, so I think there was a lot of pent-up consumer spending. Uh, rates at that time, for the most part of the year, were relatively low. Um, so I think there was a, a successful uh, businesses, um, and I should say all, because some were still um, definitely still impacted by COVID um, and, some, and restrictions. Uh, but many businesses had great years, I, I believe, in 2022. And I think um, all good things come to an end and there's cycles to an economy. Um, and I think 2023 is the beginning of that. Graham, what about you? What would the conversation have been like a year ago from now with you? Yeah, I think uh, a lot of those conversations would have been, <clears throat> how are we getting back down to quote unquote normal? So obviously we had a turbulent couple of years. So how do we just transition back to where we were at pre-pandemic? Um, so we had a lot of those conversations as well. Um, I feel like businesses were now focusing more on the future growth compared to just weathering the storm. So when we take a look at, um, we have both of you here to talk about both business and personal financing. Um, Chris, has there been a shift in, I'll use the word matrix, but a, a pivot or a shift in the matrix of how people balance their personal finances and their business finances? I think a business owner pre and post pandemic still views every, um, typically views everything as one. Uh, I think so their personal debts, their business debts and, and their business assets and personal assets, they, they don't view it necessarily as one, um, like, group, but I think they they look at everything in totality. But I think probably the biggest difference I'd say post pandemic is probably a bit more and it ties back into the interest rates is a bit more sensitivity around interest rates, how much debt are they carrying, what's a reasonable amount of debt, and is their goals to to grow uh, the pie by through leverage or is it to take some chips off the table and start repaying some debts? Uh, and probably since maybe not necessarily post pandemic, but more in 2023, definitely had more conversations with clients uh, trying to reduce their exposure uh, to the amount of debt that they've carried, especially if it's variable debt. And I think um, the, the unfortunate conversations, but interesting conversations next year would be any of those clients that um, are refinancing um, that say that had five year mortgages that were at two, three or two or three um, percent back in 2019 uh, coming up in 2024. Uh, Graham, I'm going to take the business conversation out of this and just say people's personal finances. What sort of balance or shifts have you seen in the way over the last year that people are managing their personal money? Yeah, I think um, like a lot of people were focused on just, I, I want to say use the, the word hoarding their cash as much as possible just because they want to, again, don't know what's going to be turning around the corner. So I think a lot of people were doing that personally. Um, they weren't wanting to look at future growth for that money. They just wanted to kind of stay put and keep that money on hand. We're starting to see that shift back to where they're wanting to get some uh, personal investments in and start looking at that again, um, just because they're feeling more comfortable with the future. Okay, so we're moving into 2024. We're going to take a look back now and do just another bit of an assessment on 2023 and what possible priorities could have emerged in the way people manage their money. We're going to talk about that next. On Chamber Chats today, we're talking about your money, whether it's business or personal money with a couple of experts in that. Uh, Chris Work is with us. He is the chair of the Board of Governors of our Greater Victoria Chamber of Commerce. He is a partner at Dosange and Work, an accounting firm. And uh, Graham Kay is a business banking advisor at Island Savings. Chris, I'm going to start with you. So people now looking back on the way they manage their finances in 2023, what should we have been learning from that? So and each each business would be different, but I think there's a couple of uh, commonalities that every every business can look at. Um, and so there would be uh, certain sales and profitability metrics uh, that every business can review. Uh, there's certain margins um, and um, turnover ratios uh, that are kind of um, different met different uh, goals or targets for each type of industry. Uh, but they're all things that can be can be reviewed uh, by a small by a business owner. And I think it's also the other one would be is at the start of each year or fiscal year for each business, um, it's prudent to have a, a, a plan. And obviously plans have to be adjusted as the year goes and progresses, uh, but comparing your results to the plan and um, seeing what what ones were hit, uh, if there was, there was misses or variances that were significant, uh, what was the reason? Um, and then really with this information now for 23, it's um, 23 is, well, this is uh, being recorded at the mid-December here, so it's pretty much uh, pretty much over. People are getting ready for the holidays, but it's kind of a good time to start planning out for the next year um, and using the information that you've accumulated from 2023 and coming up with the best plan uh, for 2024 and beyond. Yeah, I want to loop back on that in a second, but uh, Graham, certainly everybody's spending habits have changed, I would think, whether you're a big company or a small family, whatever it is, just because of inflation and interest, people's spending habits have changed, have they not? 
They definitely have changed. Um, I think with inflation hitting, what we saw a lot of people was seeking alternatives as well. So for business-wise, seeking alternative uh, suppliers and things like that. Um, a lot of the people that I did talk to, they look back on it and they said, basically we weathered the storm with inflation, but they wanted to look back and they wish they would have seek some potential alternatives um, for any suppliers for their businesses. Um, and also for the personal as well as just looking at different alternatives instead of just staying the course. Uh, and Graham, I'm going to stick with you for this question. Things, I guess in a sense, we sort of adjust for inflation. We know that it's in place. We know what's happened. Things may flatten out, but prices are not going to go down, are they? Yeah. I mean, what we're seeing is obviously all-time highs for a lot of pricing. Um, we're hard to see. I know when even we look into like the real estate market of Victoria, uh, looking back, we're not going to see those pre-pandemic potential housing uh, prices. So we know that they are here to stay. Um, so it's just doing a bit more planning around that. And also, I guess, planning in case we do see inflation go up again. So I think it's just good that it happened in the sense that we know that it can happen and what we can see um, for also kind of risk management for the future. So Chris, go back to what you said about learning from 2023 and projecting that into 2024. What's the advice that you're offering people on that? Yeah, I guess it would be, um, the, and the real basic advice would be is to have accurate information and timely information. So um, for many business owners, and it is a challenge to kind of accumulate their their records, but the more, the smaller the business, it's sometimes the more challenge it is, it gets pushed off. And the larger the business, uh, sometimes would have a controller or CFO uh, that's able to keep everything current. Um, but to the extent that you have current information, um, and reliable information, you could use that as a foundation and a basis uh, for next year. So you can't really start planning for the next year till you, till you close out the current year. Um, so I think the the first piece of advice is uh, making sure you have the systems processes in place uh, so you can have reliable information for 2023. And then uh, taking that and doing a plan for 2024. So um, especially with uh, in, inflation and, ch and changing interest rates, uh, changing costs, um, having a plan for okay, what is what's product pricing? What's a reasonable number of sales? What's uh, what are salaries looking like next year? Uh, what are capital expenditures going to be? Um, and planning those out, um, not necessarily by depending on the size of the business, it could be by month or by quarter. Uh, by having a game plan and then just holding yourself accountable to those. So having um, having meetings uh, quarterly to kind of go through your results to budgets and seeing okay, um, where are we hitting these? What are what are we missing? Um, and then what can we do to to address those misses? So we're looking at people now that are trying to reorganize the way they do things and trying to make those plans. So Chris, I'm going to stick with you for this. Is there anything in our financial planning, the stuff that you talked about, is there anything that's too late to do, or is there always a chance to do something new? So no, there's always, there are certain things that are always too late. So um, we're recording here in mid December. So there's certain things that have to be done uh, before the end of the calendar year. Um, and there's, these tend to be a bit more on the personal side, um, but there's certain ones where it's, um, donations uh there's uh contributions to certain tax plans um either uh, rsps or esps or, or tfsas um there's as well um plans to um selling shares that are say maybe have a loss or realizing capital losses uh that have to be done uh, before the end of the the calendar year and new to businesses uh the last two years is um, it, there's a very favorable tax treatment for uh, investing in capital assets and writing those off quickly. Uh, so small businesses are able to write off up to one and a half million uh, in one calendar year uh, for any capital assets acquired and put in use uh, before the end of the calendar year. Uh, so uh, obviously time's a little tight here uh, with holidays coming up, but there is an opportunity to, for purchasing assets um, and having that immediate expensing um, that can all be done before the end of the calendar year. Um, but obviously there's also things that can be done uh, longer term um, that are, are plans that uh, address um, tax situations or, or profitability uh, over a number of years. But the ones I mentioned are ones that have a bit more of a time impact. Yeah, our RSPs are the end of March. I think, end, of, end, end of February, end of uh, February. for RSPs. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Graham, I want to go back to you and pick up on some of the stuff that Chris was talking about. Do a lot of your clients really understand the benefits they're entitled to, yet they, they don't go there? Yeah, I think it's for a lot of that, it's all about educating them. Um, so for some of those things, like uh, all the benefits that they can take advantage of. So mostly talking about investment accounts. Um, many business owners are very focused on their RSPs. Um, we do know that. I think there's also a good opportunity for some of our young up and coming business owners to take advantage of the new first home savings account. Um, what we see is um, a lot at time is TFSAs aren't really being utilized as much as they should be. I think that's one that um, I've seen for many, many years, especially with business owners. I think they really just focus in on the RSPs, but also looking at the tax-free savings. Um, I find that 
the word tax-free savings account, um, it should be almost switched more to a tax-free investing account. A lot of people treat it like a savings account, like they're checking savings, but um, they're not really utilizing that for long-term investments, which I've had a few uh, business owners this year where we've really looked at that and taking advantage of those. Yeah, and there's a cap on that too, right? The amount you can put in every year? Correct. Yeah. Okay, well, there are people who are going to be renewing mortgages soon. We want to talk about that and transitioning from that whole work from home thing that has an impact on everybody's revenue and their money management too. We're going to talk about that next. On Chamber Chats today, we're talking about the transition from 2023 into 2024, all the turmoil of 2023 with interest rates and inflation and all the things that just kind of blew up in our face. As we move into the brand new year, there's things that we need to take a look at. So Chris, when somebody comes to you and says, okay, my mortgage is up in three months, what do you tell them? I tell them to go talk to Graham. <laughs> okay. <Good call. laughs> so, no, but in all seriousness, um, if it's coming up in three months, um, the, uh, obviously that's quick. I think it is uh, twofold. One, it's um, having the right information for 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 your bank or credit union uh, to be able to to assess. Okay, how much uh, equity can they can they refinance for? Um, and then the other side is a budget. So um, I, I think they know whether they're. Um, what their current rates are, and then seeing, okay, what their future rates are, and then how does that fit in with their um, financial planning and, and capacity to pay for that. And then I think the other uh, the other component, um, which I believe um, Graham would be the best one to speak to, is whether uh, they go variable or fixed. Uh, we're at the or a high point of uh, interest rates. Um, th there's obviously some speculation or, or hope uh, that the rates come down. Uh, so would you want to fix at, at the peak? Um, but at the same time, uh, there's a, a premium for paying for, for certainty and knowledge of, of what your payments are going to be. Yeah. Okay. So Graham, uh, Chris's client is now sitting in front of you. <laughs> it says the same says, okay, I have to renew in three months. What do I need to ask myself and what should we do? Yeah, so I think uh, I approach it as control what you can control. It's uh, timing is never going to be something that you're going to be able to uh, see in the future. So um, when we're having those conversations, um, really what we want to know is the emotions of the member sitting in front of us. Um, by emotions, I mean, what are they looking for in their mortgage payment? Is it the stability? Is it the lowest interest rate possible? Is it comfortable payments? Uh, pay off the mortgage as soon as possible. There's many different factors that we want to look at, which narrowing in on one of those of where their emotions are most invested in. I know for a lot of people, if they're losing sleep at night just because of their uh, potential that their mortgage rate could change in a variable, well, then that might not be something that should be good for them. Um, it really depends on that as much as we know that our financials are emotions. So we need to make sure that we understand them as much as we can for that member in front of us and then go with the best option that they know that they're going to be sleeping at night. Um, have you had people come to you yet, um, Graham, and say, well, I, I can't afford this house anymore. I have to sell it. Have you, are you hearing any of that? So I've had that not, more on the business side. I think that's what, people with their investment properties. Those are where it's getting a bit tricky, where, again, when they bought in 2020, 2021 with such a low interest rate, they're starting to feel the pressure on a lot of those. Now, when I also look at that, um, those was the same business owners or the same uh, people as well. Um, they're able to support those payments in the sense that they have that cash flow. They're feeling a bit tight. So what we want to look at is, is it really that detrimental? Is there any expenses that we could be cutting? Um, so looking at those sides of things, and it, it comes down to emotions as well. I think people can weather the storm with interest rates over the next little while, but if they're, again, losing sleep over it every single night, is that something that they want to stay invested in that property? Um, we've seen also some people obviously buying within the, the craze of 2021, 2022, um, seeing those houses uh, value drop, even if it's just BC assessment. Um, so that brings some emotions as well, but I think this is just the nature of uh, real estate investing for some of those members. Yeah, so that's where the pushback from the people that bought properties for the purpose of it being a VRBO or an Airbnb. So instead of getting 200 bucks a night with 70% occupancy, they're going to get $2,600 a month or something uh, in lieu of that. Chris, what about you? Are people saying to you, I, I have to sell, I can't keep this going anymore? There is that conversation. And I think um, maybe the one that I would see a bit more typical, not not so much on the real estate side, would be sales businesses. So with, um, and it's, it parallels the same um, con or theory that for uh, refinancing a mortgage, but with rates high, um, there's less oper there's uh, less buyers or, or of potential businesses or, or even expansion of uh, assets that say within a business are struggling because or have it more difficult difficulty because uh, their cost of capital is higher, what they could pay is less. Um, so you have business owners who want to sell who are waiting for a better market for a capital market to sell. Um, so they're waiting for with, with hope that interest rates come down. Um, 
and then so they don't want to necessarily lock in on a sale price today. Uh, they want to wait till there's a better better economy to do so. Yeah, uh, Graham, work from home is here to stay in every sector, every place, every community all over the world, really. So just give me a kind of a broad look at how the work from home thing has changed the dynamic of personal and business finance management. Yeah, so I think um, just a clear example of what we've seen from work from home. So I think some of the biggest impact I've seen work from home is some of the bookkeepers uh, that are dealing with a lot of these businesses. So instead of running around to each business, um, them trying to do everything they can on the on the books, what they have been doing is obviously uh, sitting at home and, and doing that all remotely, which is giving them more opportunity to do more bookkeeping. Um, so I've seen that impact work from home. I mean, especially in our industry, work from home was a major thing as well on the credit union side. Um, um, what I also see is uh, no more sick days. You always have the ability to work from home. So we've seen <laughs> that go away. Um, but I do think that having that technology push for the work from home has been very impactful. It has brought a lot of things over these last few years. If it's e-signatures, if it's anything else that we can do remotely, I feel like we've advanced almost five to 10 years into the future. Yeah. I mean, Chris, there are pros and cons to work from home and you see that all the time, right? Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely see a number of pros. Like I think uh, one is um, sometimes certain work is just easier to do if it's focused and you're not uh, talking to, getting distracted by a uh, by number of conversations, which are fun and always interesting conversations. But sometimes there is a productivity to just being uh, alone and then just uh, getting through certain things. But I think on the on the, the con side of it, there is a, there's a number of things that are um, detrimental, I think, long-term term to a business. I think there's certain work uh, that requires collaboration. Uh, and you could do these, obviously, via Zoom, uh, like like how we are doing today. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's certain ones that are just uh, easier or better results. Uh, if you're in the same room, uh, you could uh, read body language easier. You could communicate easier. Um, and I think the other one, longer term, is uh, mentorship and training. So if you're uh, bringing in young staff and all your senior people are working remotely, uh, who's there to train uh, train train those uh, future leaders and future managers um, of the business? Um, again, a lot can be done remotely, but is it as effective? Um, I think that's the question. And I think really what's here to stay is a hybrid of both. Um, so you get uh, trying to get the best of both worlds. So finding the balance for each people or each employee uh, and fi- and seeing, okay, where, where the best fit is and what days should they be in the office? Uh, what days should they be at home? And I think in our profession, that's, that's definitely here to stay. Cool. Well, Dealing in your own finances personally or through a business that you have, whatever it might be, seeking the help of a financial professional is something we always advise, and that's why we had two of them with us today. Uh, Chris Work is a partner at Dusange and Work, and he is the chair of the Board of Governors, uh, sorry, Board of Directors at the Greater Victoria Chamber of Commerce. Chris, thanks for coming out. Nice to see you again. No problem. Thank you for having me, Bruce. And Graham, uh, Graham K. Rather is a business banking advisor with Island Savings. Graham, thanks to you for your time and your expertise. Yes, thanks for having me. And I'm Bruce Williams. We'll see you again for another Chamber Chat.